Hi everybody, my name is Kelsey Shepard and I'm here with Samantha Gibson from the Digital Public Library of America. Welcome to our DPLA workshop today which is called Making Audio Collections Accessible and it's presented by Pop-Up Archive and Duke University Libraries. DPLA's workshops are online learning opportunities that highlight subjects central to our community including education, technology, copyright, genealogy, collections, and more. So we're really excited about today's workshop, um, which is a special learning opportunity for our colleagues across the country at DPLA hubs and at contributing institutions. And if there are folks on the call from outside the DPLA network, that's great too, and we welcome you all. In today's workshop, presenters from Pop-Up Archive and Duke University Libraries will share an inside look at their collaboration on the Duke Chapel Recordings Project, which they are transcribing and making searchable a collection of audio and video sermons in order to expand access, use, and discoverability of this collection. Along the way, our partners at Pop-Up Archive will introduce best practices for audio collection accessibility, including transcription and searchability. So at this point, I'm going to hand things off to Samantha to give you some logistics. Hi, everyone. So a few quick pieces of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, you will notice that you are in listen-only mode. If you have questions about the presentation or if you are experiencing technical difficulties, please feel free to type them into the questions box and we'll do our best to address any issues. For this webinar, we have approximately 40 to 45 minutes worth of presentation, followed by approximately 10 minutes for questions. So please do enter questions throughout the presentation, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end. We are recording this presentation, and we'll post a copy of it to the workshops page of our website shortly following the end of the session. So without further ado, let me introduce today's presenters. Today we'll hear from Anne Wooten, co-founder and CEO of Pop-Up Archive, Lita Meritz, Pop-Up Archive Community Manager, Molly Bragg, Digital Collections Program Manager at Duke University Libraries, Valerie Gillespie, Duke University Archivist, and Katie Ross, Graduate Student Assistant for the Chapel Recordings Project. First, Anne will introduce some of the basics of working with audio collections and share a bit about Pop-Up Archive. Anne, take it away. Thank you, Samantha. Um, so, uh, like Samantha said, my name is Anne, and I am one of the co-founders of Pop-Up Archive. Um, we are excited to be participating in this workshop today, um, not least because uh, at Pop-Up Archive, we get to work with a lot of different types of collections of spoken word, audio, oral histories, and audio archives, and one of the best parts of our work is getting to um, compare experiences and best practices across those organizations and hopefully uh, share them back to the communities that will benefit from them most. So we're glad to be here today and eager to share some of our experience um, which will be particularly nicely highlighted for all of you I think through uh, the Duke Library's uh, case study that I will certainly get more in, into detail on. Some quick background on Pop-Up Archive. Uh, we were founded in 2013. Um, my co-founder, Bailey, and I uh, first started Pop-Up Archive as a proof of concept, really, to help uh, public independent radio producers, the Kitchen Sisters, who have been working in the Bay Area for um, going on four decades now and had all sorts of different audio in multiple various formats um, stored in their offices and across various different physical locations. We created Pop-Up Archive to be a simple, straightforward, web-based method for organizing and uh, searching and thus finding and discovering uh, archival audio. Um, the way it works is pretty straightforward. Uh, I'll take you through that and show you a few examples of some of the types of collections that we've worked with um, before handing it over to Duke. Um, we were funded initially by the, the Knight Foundation. We've also worked on some uh, major projects with 
the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Institute for Museum and Library Services, um, most notably in the, in the latter case on the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, which is over 40,000 hours of public media audio from stations across the United States spanning 50 years of public media history. Um, using Pop-Up Archive, we hope, is pretty straightforward. Um, we take a number of different uh, audio file formats you see listed on the screen um, that I'm scrolling through slowly now. Uh, those can be uh, um, processed um, as, as simply as dragging and dropping them onto our website, um, or we do a number of different batch upload uh, options, whether that's through our API um, or through XML import. We've done a lot of work with the PB Core um, audiovisual metadata standard for anyone for whom that rings a bell. And the main, um, you know, magic at play here, if I can call it that, is the speech to text software that we work with at Pop Up Archive. So the software has been specially trained for public media, oral history, first person um, speech, and um, it is uh, entirely automated. It transcribes audio files in pretty close to real time, um, if not faster. And then it also, also automatically timestamps the audio. Um, and then we analyze the transcripts to pull out um, keywords and proper nouns that are all intended to sort of help generate additional metadata. Um, one of the earliest lessons we learned was that no matter how well-meaning or well-intentioned, um, creating large quantities of metadata for audiovisual collections at scale is virtually impossible um, for any human or uh, team of humans to accomplish, um, regardless of the resources that they may have. Um, and of course, taking into account the fact that many of the collections and institutions we work with have, um, have constraints in that area as well. Um, audio can be stored by pop-up archive if necessary. We also uh, work closely with the Internet Archive to provide a free and hopefully indefinite um, storage horizon for digital preservation. Um, the, um, the other feature of Pop-Up Archive is that uh, we've built this dashboard and really home for audio collections. Um, they, can be, they can be public. Uh, the Internet Archive, for example, um, or privately stored, depending on various copyrights and licensing concerns that an, an institution or audio collection might have. Um, and then we also provide team access so that multiple uh, staff or volunteers or interns um, can access the audio once it's been transcribed. Um, and we provide uh, an, an interactive editor that marries audio with text so that you can search for terms within your audio, uh, find them at the exact moments that they're located, also make corrections to the machine-generated transcript, um, have multiple users logging in, uh, and then ultimately benefit from uh, Im embeddable player tools that we also provide uh, if you want to take the output and functionality of pop-up archive and these interactive transcripts uh, back to your own website or your own institution's web presence. Um, I mentioned public collections at pop-up archive, so I'm going to jump over. This is our explore page, which features some of the archival collections that we've worked with and, and voices from within those collections, as well as newer, more contemporary audio collections that we work with. Um, our partners include a range from podcasters and public radio stations to audio archives, uh, like some of the ones that you see listed here, universities like Duke uh, um, or Princeton, um, and public libraries like the New York Public Library and the San Francisco Public Library and others. Um, we provide um, ways for you to add as much metadata or for us to ingest as much metadata as may already exist with your audio collections. Um, and we also, as I mentioned, generate metadata automatically um, where it may otherwise be lacking or there is not the time or resources to create um, that type of metadata. And so you'll see some of that listed here um, in this sort of browsable interface for the the, the entire breadth of public audio um, that has been processed by and in some cases is housed at Pop-Up Archive. Um, it gets particularly interesting um, 
over in the tag and entities categories because that's where we're actually pulling out metadata from the, the audio and our automatically generated transcripts themselves. Um, so I invite you all to, to take it for a spin and search around the site yourselves. Uh, I'll show you a couple of quick examples before we move into Duke. Uh, you may have just seen this Studs Turkle radio archive uh, mentioned on our Explore page. Um, Studs Turkle uh, was on air for uh, at least an hour a day, five days a week for over 40 years at the WFMT radio network in Chicago. And they, together with the Chicago History Museum, are now the stewards of his enormous and, and pretty incredible archive of interviews with Americans of all different walks of life. Um, and not just Americans. One of my favorite interviews of him is a conversation he had on the way to a Janis Joplin concert in London talking to a London cabbie. Um, the page that I pulled up from their archive here is uh, the Chicago category and I pulled it up because it's highlighting programs where studs uh, spoke with people um, from Chicago or about Chicago and as you'll see uh, as I scroll down here they uh, have embedded pop-up archives player here so that people can uh, listen and uh, watch the text uh, scroll along with the audio as it plays um, or search within that audio. Um, another major use case we see for pop-up archive is accessibility. Um, whether federal legislation and requirements um, or otherwise, there are a number of media uh, outlets, um, radio stations, as well as uh, archival institutional collections of audio that use pop-up archive to help make uh, their audiovisual materials more accessible, particularly to hearing impaired uh, audiences. I'm going to jump over now to um, the Wisconsin Historical Society, uh, which is based at the uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, um, who's worked with Pop Up Archive for a while. Uh, Wisconsin Historical Society's collections are largely stored and um, and maintained through Content DM as their content management system. And in their case, they've actually chosen to uh, link from Content DM to this public collection of theirs at Pop-Up Archive, where they've added descriptive information, thumbnails uh, to illustrate their audio items, um, and are basically leveraging the, the, the search and filtering capabilities of Pop-Up Archive to provide access to their audio. Um, and then I can click on any one of these items, and you'll get to see more of this with Duke as well. Um, to see what the, um, the single audio item interface looks like um, with the transcript here. And then I can search uh, inside of this transcript um, and we'll get uh, exact word or phrase level matches wherever they occur in the audio, which I can then click on to listen to. So this comes in handy, especially for scholars, researchers, journalists, anyone who's trying to um, tap into and really uh, explore audio that is otherwise as opaque and sort of black boxy as an MP3 or, or WAV file. Um, last but not least, I'm going to jump over to the Presbyterian Historical Society's website. Um, this is an Islandora repository where PHS has also used the pop-up archive embeddable player um, to provide the, um, the playback and find and transcript functionality that you just saw. Um, so in this case, their audio collection is living side by side along with other assets in Islandora. <clears throat> and they have made corrections to the, to the machine generated transcript. Um, as you can probably see below, inserting more details on speakers and speaker changes, um, which, is a, which is a functionality that our software provides, um, but it doesn't recognize the actual names of the speakers. That's something that you, at this point at least, still have to add in yourself. Um, so I'm about at the 10 minute mark. I'm going to uh, stop myself here and hand it back over to, um, to Samantha and ultimately Duke so that we can dive right into um, to their particular collection and use case. I should mention, last but not least, the transcripts um, and other metadata that we generate is available, obviously, through our web interface and through our API for larger collections and, uh, and programmatically at scale. The transcripts, and you'll hear more about this in a minute, are um, 
exportable as text files, as XML, as JSON, which is a little more, a couple more machine readable options, um, as well as standard captioning formats like SRT and WebVTT. Um, basically, we're just trying to make the data that we create as useful in as many different formats as, um, as possible. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back over to, uh, to, to Samantha, I believe. Um, please feel free to ask any questions as the webinar goes on, and certainly at the, in the, during the time that we've reserved at the end. We're more than happy to answer them. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. And next up, we'll hear from the team at Duke University Libraries. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Valerie Gillespie. I'm the university archivist at Duke, and I'm uh, here with two of my colleagues to talk a little bit about the Duke Chapel Recordings project that we have been working on for the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the way that we came to form the partnership on campus and how it's been mutually beneficial for both the library and our campus partners. As a little bit of context, Duke University is located in Durham, North Carolina. It's a 178-year-old institution. The historic West Campus was built in the late 1920s and early 1930s, and this is where Molly, Katie, and I work. The three collaborating units for this project are located very close together, as you will see on this slide. Divinity School is located uh, right next to the chapel. The chapel, obviously, is there in the center and the library is next to the Divinity School. So we have uh, uh, actually been working closely together in addition to being physically adjacent with each other. And I think that our collaboration has been a really great experience for everybody involved. Uh, a little context, about five years ago, a faculty member and a chapel staff member met with me to talk about the possibility of digitizing a few of the recordings that we in the University Archives held of chapel sermons and services. At that time, the University Archives had around 2,700 recordings from the mid-1950s to the early 2000s, and these were on a variety of formats, including audio reels, cassettes, and VHS tapes. There were recordings of sermons and sometimes entire services featuring the dean of the chapel, but there were also numerous, numerous guest preachers who have visited Duke since the chapel opened in 1932. The folks that I met with, Divinity Professor Chuck Campbell and chapel staff member Fred Westbrook, were excited about the possibilities. They recognized many of the names of the preachers, and they thought there would be widespread interest in making them available online. They selected around 50 recordings to start, focusing mainly on a selection of black preachers. We digitized the recordings in-house uh, as what we call a patron request as opposed to a full-fledged digital collection. We gave them back to our, our partners and they published them via iTunes. And this was the, the initial publication of our chapel recordings. Uh, this was a success and there was interest in expanding it beyond this uh, one iTunes instance. The Divinity School offered the help of a graduate student who, using an ancient photocopied handwritten list of sermons, inventoried each box, and there were 60 boxes of recordings, in our reading room and created an item level description of the contents. We were able to use this to improve our finding aid. So this is just a, a little glimpse at our archival finding aid for the collection. Uh, previously, we had just sort of had dates for what was in the boxes. This allowed us to know who was speaking, the name of their sermon, the date it was given, and we also had information about the original format. In using this list, the Chapel and Divinity Partners selected an additional 100 recordings, and these became the basis of our first Chapel Recordings uh, digital collection. Uh, the collection launched in 2014, and this was a step forward for us in terms of having a, a digital video player in our digital collections uh, program. Several months later, Chuck Campbell and the Dean of the Chapel, Luke Powery, came back with a new proposal asking if we would help them with an application for a grant from the Lilly Foundation to digitize many more recordings. This was a great opportunity for us to do pres preservation digitization of the recordings, and it was also a great opportunity to partner on campus. 
We pulled together numbers on the costs for digitization, transcription, and enhanced metadata as best we could with what we had. And in late 2014, we received the news that we had been successful, with our part of the grant budget being approximately $250,000. Given the extent of the digitization, which was estimated to be more than 1,300 audio recordings and video recordings, uh, which Molly will talk about in just a minute, uh, we wanted to, to work closely with the faculty and staff in the Divinity School and the chapel, and uh, uh, Katie is one of the graduate students who has been working on this collection, adding uh, metadata to the content that we have now. Uh, before we get into the work that Katie's doing now, I'm going to turn it over to Molly, who's going to talk a little bit about the digital collection and the digital collections program here at Duke. Hi there. Uh, my name is Molly Bragg. I'm the digital collections program manager. Uh, here at Duke University Libraries. So we uh, have a digital collections program um, and under that umbrella we have digitization services. So we digitize rare, unique, and significant holdings of the library. We, public, we publish those collections online through innovative interfaces. And you can see examples of all of our projects online at the link on your screen. So we have been working with AV materials for many years now. Um, we've published them on third-party platforms and started publishing them in our own platform with the Chapel Recordings collection itself. So we have also been working with uh, captions, closed captions, and transcriptions as well for several years. Most of these have been donor supplied and we've handled them in a couple of different ways. So we have a collection of oral histories, it's called Behind the Veil, and those recordings came in with transcripts. So when we put them online, we have the recording itself, which you can see, and a link to the transcript, which you can then open and be able to read along as you listen to the recording. We have a similar interface in our finding aids that have embedded AV materials in them. So we have a couple different ways we can access AV items uh, that have recordings and transcripts. We've also played around with uh, syncing metadata and moving images at, or audio through the Oral History Metadata Synchronizer, which is an open source software tool out of uh, Kentucky. And in this example, we have silent films, but we have descriptions of different segments of the films. And so you can use the description of the segment to navigate through the film. We've also experimented with multilingual captioning. And again, these were donor supplied. Uh, in this example, we, use, we have interviews from people in China that survived the Great Famine. Uh, the interviewees in this case speak a very specific dialect, and so the closed captions provi provide English translations as well as standard Chinese translations. And again, these were donor supplied. We didn't uh, translate these from Chinese. Um, so we've been cruising along, uh, make, providing access to these donor-supplied transcripts and closed captions, and we thought we were doing great work, uh, which we were. <laughs> but we did come along, uh, in February 2015, there was a lawsuit at Harvard and MIT. Uh, they were sued by the National Association of the Deaf over their assets that they had online, their AV assets that were online and streaming. And the... The lawsuit was around not just online courseware, but also items that they had made accessible for the public good, which is what our digital collections fall under. So we had many conversations here at Duke about the lawsuit and what our reaction should be. We definitely didn't want to take down any of our AV collections, but we felt that it was very important for us to demonstrate a proactive response. So we decided that moving forward, we would create closed captions or transcriptions for our AV collections that were going online when it was feasible and reasonable. So we needed an example project to work with, and luckily we were almost to the end of the digitization phase of the chapel recordings uh, when we decided to take this approach. 
Um, as Valerie said, this was a grant-funded project uh, through the Lilly Foundation. The goal was to digitize as much of the collection as we could. Um, we didn't get through all of the collection, but we got through a very sizable amount. Both the audio and the video digitization was outsourced, one to a local vendor here in North Carolina and the other and the audio to Cutting Court in Maryland. Um, we worked with those vendors to do that, and then we did the written sermons in-house. And the written sermons were really more akin to speaker's notes in most instances, so it wasn't anything that we felt could be used as a transcript. All in all, we were able to create, to digitize 1,450 hours of audio video, which is a pretty big collection by our standards, and that was 58 terabytes of data. Um, the collection launched in April 2015, and I'll show you an example in a moment. I think it's important to point out as I set the stage for Katie's demonstration, though, that from the chapel's point of view and the Divinity School's point of view, they did not want to just create this online collection of sermons and services from Duke Chapel. They really wanted to create a homiletics resource for Divinity scholars around the world. So we were not just putting the materials online, but we were, but, but the chapel and Divinity School intended to create specialized metadata for the collection, which Katie will talk about in a moment. Now, as we approached the chapel with the idea that we would not only create enhanced metadata, um, or that they would create enhanced metadata, but that we wanted to uh, create closed captions and transcriptions for the resource. They were very pleased with the idea, and we were able to work with the Lilly Foundation to allocate some funding to do that. Uh, here's an example of what the items look like within the collection. You can see we have an audio item with the player right there, and then basic metadata that exists for the collection right now. Things like speaker name, date, and uh, collection and format. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Katie, uh, who's going to walk us through some of the work she's been doing with the collection. Thank you. My name is Katie Ross, and um, I'm going to be showing you a little bit about what it's been like to work on this project and to work with Pop-Up Archive. Um, but first, a little background on how I got involved with the project. Um, the library just decided to, as has been mentioned, to partner with the chapel in the Divinity School. And um, I took a preaching sermon class with uh, one of the professors who's been involved with the project, and he asked a few of us if we would like to help work on this project. I think the partnership has worked out really well, both um, for us, because it's a really interesting uh, job to have, as, as it's a subject of interest to me, um, but also for the library, it's, it's really helpful to have uh, students working on this project who are familiar with the subject material and some of the specialized terms. Um, so I think it's been a great partnership. Um, when we signed on, the first step was to get permission from um, the preachers whose sermons would be included in this archive. So we spent some time working on obtaining permission first. And then the next step was to go ahead and um, work on the transcripts. So I'm going to show you here a couple examples from Pop-Up Archive. And so we have here, um, this is what it looks like when we get the automated uh, software generated transcript. Um, and in general, uh, I'll show you a little bit about what it's like to work on this interface to make corrections and that sort of thing. I will say it's, I think it's very easy to use. Um, the correctness of the transcript is generally quite good. Usually we have to make some corrections to uh, capitalization and punctuation, that sort of thing, and sometimes proper names and specialized terms um, don't come out exactly right. There is some variance as well in the correctness depending on the precision or the accent of the speaker the, and the number of, of specialized or obscure references. So um, in our case, sometimes that means preachers are quoting Hebrew or Greek words or referencing theologians, and that doesn't always come through in the automated transcript, so we do have to make those corrections. So when it's time to work on the transcript, it's quite easy to use, and I'll give you an example here. Um, you can click through using the mouse and um, 
it will highlight line by line the, the part of the audio file that's being worked upon. And so here's one example. You can see it's generally pretty accurate and just needs a few corrections to, as I mentioned, punctuation and that sort of thing. The most terminal, famous sermon illustration of all time is, uh, is the story of Blondin, the great tightrope walker. Okay, so that's the first sentence, and um, I can use the mouse to navigate. I can also use arrows, and there's a tab shortcut that will pause as you go along, which makes it quite easy to, to start and stop when I need to make a quick correction. Um, and then kind of go along. Here we have the proper name Blondin, so I had to make correction to that. Um, I had to Google it to find out how to spell it, but that's sort of how it how it looks like to work on the text, um, and I think it's it's quite easy to work with. The great tightrope walker. So um, the, a couple things just to note about working on these. Um, you do have to be careful, as as you can see, it's highlighting in blue the the audio portion that correspond or the words that correspond to the audio portion, and you do have to be a little bit careful when you're working on it, um, not to to mess up the timing. So if you're working kind of on the edges of one of those phrases, like if I needed to make a correction here, I would just have to be careful that I didn't sort of delete them into each other and that, that might mess up the timing. Um, other than that, it's it's very straightforward. Um, you can also see here, uh, this doesn't apply as much to our collection, but you can see here that there is a speaker function. So right here at line 54.3, we have um, it's picking up that there's a different speaker on this line than the next line. Um, it uh, that isn't true, obviously. In this case, we have one one speaker giving this entire sermon, and so we generally haven't worked with the speaker function as much, and I can't speak to its accuracy. Um, but I know that it um, is something that is available if you're working with audio files that have interviews or sort of back and forth conversation. And you can actually go in and select a speaker, assign a name to it, or add a new speaker there. So that's another feature. Um, just to give you a couple more examples, I'm just going to show you a couple other sermons that we have here. So here we had a South African preacher speaking, and you can see it I'm does. I'm going to preach on the gospel lesson this morning, my friends, and you will doubtless have gathered all. So you can see it does very well with, um, in some cases, almost better with uh, British and South African and Australian accents as they tend to be a bit more precise. Um, but we have had a little more trouble with some of the um, international speakers that we brought in. So here we had a German theologian speaking, and you can see there's a lot less accuracy um, here. So I was struck by text and music of this one line. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. So sometimes you get entertainment as well on those mistakes, but it does take a little bit more time to go back and correct um, these transcripts. In general, in terms of the time allowed, I would say for the typical sermons, um, this one would take longer, but for the typical audio files, it takes us about two to three times the length of the sermon to go back and make collections. So it is kind of a time investment, um, but it's been worth it for us because um, as I'm not only working on the transcript and correcting it, I'm also then pulling metadata and making an abstract, and so it's helpful to, to I, would, I would have to go through it anyway and listen closely. Um, and so that's sort of a general, general guideline. That, or at least that's how it's been in our experience. So last I just want to show you an example of a completed transcript. This is one where I've gone back and made all the corrections here and uh, you can see, let's see, you can see some, we've had to add quotations here, um, added all the, all the names and all that and it's, uh, it's fully corrected. And so um, this is now ready for us to use both to make the collection searchable and for the closed captions as Molly and Val mentioned. Um, and then also we use it to pull out enhanced metadata that will be used in this um, database um, to, to help it, to help scholars and students be able to, to search for these sermons. So um, what that looks like for us is, uh, 
pulling out information like the liturgical season, the, the kind of time of the church year, like Lent or Advent. Uh, we pull out enhanced metadata on holy days like Christmas and Easter, the reading chapter and verse, um, so which part of scripture it's coming from, so that uh, preachers or students could search for a sermon based on the specific text that they're looking for. Um, the, the transcripts have been really helpful in this as well because as uh, as has been mentioned, we in some cases have audio file of the entire church service and so it's really easy to just scroll back in the transcript to the part where the this, this scripture was read and find out which chapter and verse it's referencing. Um, and then finally we have the subject terms, and most of these are linked to Library of Congress terms. There's been some editing in these particular terms, but this gives you a general idea of the kind of terms that we're working with, and there's many. Um, they range from theological terms like angels or baptism to uh, sort of social issues, climate change, civil disobedience. And so we've been able to, it's, it's really nice to have the transcripts there to kind of scroll back through and refresh our memory as we pull out some of the relevant terms that will make this collection even more usable and searchable. So those are some of the ways that we've been using this collection. And um, when we get to our Q&A time, I'm happy to answer any more questions about what it's been like to work on this. Now I'll pass it back to Molly for just one minute. Thanks, Katie. So in terms of next steps uh, for the project, the Divinity School will continue their awesome work uh, with Katie and her colleagues in the lead. Um, we're really excited about having that work. Um, Duke Digital Collections, we're in the process of scaling up the capacity and the feature set of our AV player. Um, and once we do that, we'll be in a better position to start importing um, both the enhanced metadata as well as web VTT formatted transcriptions, closed captions uh, from the pop-up system. Um, and then we'll integrate those with our AV player so that uh, sometime in the next couple of years, folks will be able to come to our collection um, and use it for that homiletic resource that the Divinity School envisioned. I will say, um, I forgot to mention um, in a previous slide that once we decided that we wanted to enter into this kind of work with the Duke Chapel recording collection, um, we did look at a number of different vendors and we evaluated them based on our desires, um, the size of the collection, what kind of services the vendor provided, um, and we evaluated about about four different vendors before we decided that pop-up was the vendor for us. Um, and one of the tipping points was that they, um, although that they didn't have web VTT uh, as a export format at the time, they were committed to, in, to developing it, which was um, a, good, a good thing for us because that's the format that we wanted to use because it integrates well with the technology that we're using. So with that, um, more to come in the next couple years for this collection. And with that, I will hand control back over to Samantha and Kelsey, um, and we'd be happy to take all your questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Molly, Val, and Katie. Um, so with that, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, please do go ahead and enter any and all questions that you have in that chat box. Um, and I will go ahead and read them and we'll um, do our best to get through as many as we can. Um, so I will go ahead and start with our first question. Um, curious if pop-up is considering functionality that would allow you to, quote, snap to, an existing transcript that isn't time-coded. Um, yes, I can definitely speak to that. This is Anne. Um, it is something that we are considering. Um, we've certainly been asked about it before for those collections that have pre-existing transcripts and want to uh, sync them up to the audio, which is, I think, what you're describing. Um, it's not something that is planned for the immediate future just because, frankly, there are so many collections that don't have transcripts to begin with that we've had our hands more than full working with those. Um, however, the technology definitely exists um, and is becoming I don't know, um, more and more commonplace um, or easy to find. So 
whether through us or um, or elsewhere. I think um, I don't know that there's a service that that targets sort of oral history, um, cultural heritage institutions specifically, but I know that there are that there are certainly ways of accomplishing that if it's something that you're interested in doing. Great, thanks. So the next question is, um, is Duke going to, uh, sorry, is Duke going to index text or use WebVTT for discoverability? This is Molly, um, and the answer is yes. <laughs> Part of our work to um, scale up our AV player to make it more robust um, is going to be how the, um, basically how the AV player can make sure and how, how our discovery systems will be able to index all of the captions and web VTT files that we export from pop-up. But that is absolutely one of our goals. Um, it's one of the reasons why we've embraced this work so much um, is that not only um, will our collections, will our AV collections be more accessible to people that that need alternative ways of accessing them, but also be more accessible in general uh, to the open web. So absolutely. All right, next question is, is the embeddable pop-up archive player mobile friendly slash responsive? Um, yes, it is. Um, it's something that we've put a fair bit of work into that being said, uh, as operating systems continually upgrade and change, uh, I'm sure, I mean, we're, we're aware that uh, exceptions to that can creep in, but it's something that we are um, continually updating and on top of. So uh, with the exception of, um, you know, some really old versions of Internet Explorer that, that we and, and few websites are backward compatible with, uh, the player is responsive um, and mobile friendly. Great question. Next question is, can Pop-Up Archive work with institutions that have, have audio and transcript, transcripts already to ingest them, no time coding necessary? We want the legacy collection with the, with the new moving forward. Sure, yeah, there are a couple of ways that that can work. Um, first of all, Pop-Up Archive itself, um, you know, for example, if you're thinking about using uh, multiple pop-up archive collections, as you described, to have the legacy live side by side with the new, um, we can index and create records for audio um, uh, where um, the, whether or not the transcript is the main focus for you, um, although it is a, a a functionality, a feature that comes along with the software no matter what. But some of those metadata fields that I was showing, um, we ingest from whatever pre-existing data there is. And that includes things like titles and, you know, contributors and subject headings. Um, but it can also include um, descriptions as lengthy as you like, or um, you can you could always add a pre-existing transcript as its own metadata field as a way for that older material to sort of be carried carried through and carried along with any new material that you where getting the transcripts is more of a focal point or more of an interest. Um, I I hope that answers the bulk of your question. Um, otherwise, the uh, um, I'm trying to think if there's if there's like another way. Um, we I already touched on you know the fact that like we are not at this point at least actively ingesting pre-existing transcripts and time syncing them. But it sounds like that's not uh, something that you are um, directly asking for. Um, I think the other thing I was going to mention is that it it partly depends on the implementation that you're looking for if you're going to be directing people um, to the actual pop-up archive interface um, or using our embeddable player, in which case, you know, you could use aspects of pop-up archive for new material that you need transcribed and pull that in to sit side by side effectively with your pre-existing collections. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some ideas around how that might work. 
Thanks, Anne. It looks like this might be a, actually a follow-up question. Um, can we disable search and discovery of audio on pop-up archive, instead using the API to embed the audio and player on a digital library site? We use pop-up as a storage slash transcript provider, but deliver through our existing digital library interface. I know Vimeo offers an option for this with video collections. Yeah, that's a great question, and it is something that you can do. So um, I mentioned that we have partners that that maintain both public and private collections in Pop-Up Archive, um, and actually Duke is a great example of this, where um, their collections aren't part of the public, you know, ex explore um, interface on Pop-Up Archive, but through our API, they and anyone is able to pull. Um, as much or as little data about their audio from pop-up archive for display on that site. Um, sorry, I think I might have just cut out for a minute there, but uh, the quick answer is yes, you don't, you do not need to have your material publicly available on pop-up archive in order to use um, the features of our API. All right, next question is, Concerning obtaining permission from the speakers so many years after they initially delivered their sermons, are you only making available on the open web those, uh, those for which you can contact the speaker or a family representative of the speaker for those who are now deceased? That's a great question. This is Katie, um, and I was sort of the primary person who was contacting most of the speakers, and yes, they go back to the 1950s, and we had uh, many who were deceased or um, we, we did, when possible, try to c contact family members. And um, our basic approach, and I think Val can speak a bit more to this, has been to uh, do our best and do our due diligence to, to get, obtain permission. Um, and so I will let her talk a little bit more about how that works. Sure. This is Valerie. Um, in consultation with our Director of Scholarly Communication, we came up with a game plan for seeking permissions, and as Katie said, we basically did as much as we could. We did our due diligence to try to contact the individuals or their heirs to, to secure permission. Um, Katie has kept a fabulous spreadsheet of all of the attempts to contact them and the responses we've gotten. Uh, there have been a few people who have asked not to be included, and, and we have um, uh, observed that. And for a small number of folks, uh, we've not been able to get in touch with them. Um, and so uh, under the, the um, understanding that we've done our due diligence, we have put those up, but we have uh, ways for people to get in touch with us if there are concerns down the road. I would say that the vast majority of people who are contacted say yes, and sometimes they've even asked, why are you asking me this? Isn't this already in the public domain? Um, so the response has been really favorable, but yes, we did our best to reach out to, to those uh, that we could, and for those few that we couldn't reach, but we had documentation of how we had tried to reach them, we have published those. All right, so that actually brings us to the end of the questions that have been submitted so far, but we do have time for one or two more. So if there is anyone on the call that has a question about the projects you've heard about today or even a project at your own institution that you'd like to just float to our speakers, um, please do go ahead and enter that. Well, not seeing any so far. Um, maybe we will go ahead um, and wrap up this uh, workshop webinar, although you do have um, on the slide here um, that Duke has helpfully put together um, all of our contact information. So if you do have questions that come up um, in the coming weeks and months, um, please do reach out to us. Um, so I would like to, first of all, thank um, all of our presenters, Anne, Lita, Molly, Valerie, and Katie, for speaking with us today about the Chapel Recordings Project and, more broadly, the exciting possibilities for making audio collections more easily discoverable and usable for our audiences. We are also excited to have a partnership with Pop-Up Archive, through which they have generously offered a discounted rate for services for institutions in the DPLA network. We will be sure to share links in a follow-up email. 
where you can learn more about Pop-Up Archive, the services available as part of that DPLA partnership, and the Chapel Recordings Project. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Samantha. Bye, all. <laughs>